You're listening to Neo Cash Radio, where we discuss the future of money today. In the studio with you, it's JJ, and Darren, and Randy. Big Brother lives in United Kingdom. AT&T kills net neutrality and the dangers of Bitcoin mining in Venezuela. All this and more in episode 184 here on Wednesday, November 30th, 2016. In the traditional markets, JJ, we have gold dropping again to $1,173. Although silver rebounded a bit to $16.48, oil is up to uh, $48.98. The Dow Jones rises to a new record high, uh, closing on Wednesday at 19,123 points. The 30-year Treasury continues to climb to 3.02%, and the yield uh, and the uh, euro is down slightly, uh, buying $1.05. One dollar uh, buys 6.88 Chinese yuan. And the British pound will buy you one dollar and twenty five cents. Wow! Yes, excellent. Well, in the Bitcoin market, we have uh, Bitcoin at seven hundred forty dollars, still relatively stable from last week. Uh, same thing with Litecoin at three dollars and eighty three cents. Zcash is down, uh, very uh, up and down. And whenever we talk about Zcash, we're like, it's in a range between X and X. Anyway, that range is lowered this week with sixty six dollars and eighty cents. Dash is uh, right around $8.85. Ethereum is down to $8.63. Monero is up to $8.90. Augur Rep Tokens is down to $3.69. And one doge equals one doge. Such parody. Just a reminder, you can tune into Neocache Radio every Wednesday night if you don't want to miss a single moment of awesome Neocache content, including special episodes and bonus interviews. You can subscribe to our podcast on Google Play Music, iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, YouTube, Podcast Addict, and many more. Wow, that's just too many, Randy. All of them. All and the places. Do we keep track of all the places, Randy? I check in. Okay. I make sure. Excellent. Well, starting out with our first story tonight, it's, it's obviously a big story, but it's not a news story. In fact... We've known about the UK's uh, spying on its people, just like every other Western country just about, since Edward Snowden told us about it. Well, the UK is, is, is taking this spying technology and it's making it into cardinal law, if you will, like, like absolute legal authority. And so Big Brother exists. Uh, described by Edward Snowden as the most extreme surveillance in the history of Western democracy, the investigatory bill, powers bill has sailed through the UK Parliament. Sir Tim Berners-Lee, the inventor of the World Wide Web, was asked by BBC of his thoughts regarding the bill. He said, quote, The Snoopers Charter has no place in a modern democracy. It undermines our fundamental rights online, unquote. The bill requires internet service providers keep a log of each internet user's browsing habits for a year. Wow. This data will be made available to just about any government agency that requests it, and likely whichever companies can grease the right hands. When asked about the why the campaign to uh, stop it failed, Sir Tim Berners Lee said, "Quote: I talked to James Blessing, chairman of the Internet Service Providers Association, about why its campaign has failed. He told me that for years opponents had in fact won, making su- successive governments abandon mass surveillance plans." Uh, then he, he he says a quote uh, from this this gentleman. So it's like I'm quoting a dude who's quoting another dude. Uh, it's great. Uh, quote, this bill is a zombie, which has been rearing its head in one form or another since 2007. This time it's alive, unquote, he said, unquote. So since 2007, now this is, obviously they've been doing this sort of stuff since, for, for pretty much since 9-11. They're persistent. Right? Like as far as actually doing it. And then they built up the infrastructure. And then around 2007... They they have all the pieces in place and they're like okay let's legalize this right let's let's make it just legal so for whatever reason it's just better to do it this way well it's better if you're actually doing it to do it this way right I know it's but amazing of course s- they admit they admit to illegally doing it and say they're sorry well we're just going to make it legal it's amazing how straightforward this all sounds it's usually I mean sometimes they try and get some of these things in clear view but a lot of times you see. Uh, like they're saying, coming back in one form or another, you'll see bills come up and people see terrifying language and they'll uh, start making a stir. And so then they start breaking it up into putting it into other little bills and breaking it up so it's less noticeable. And so they'll put names on it like Patriot Act and things like that so that if you vote against it, you look terrible. Investigatory powers bill. That's a difficult word to say. I'm going to keep tripping up on it. As if spying on your every click isn't enough, Randy. The UK House of Commons passed a bill outlawing many types of pornography. 
That digital economy bill requires adult websites to demand users sign up for a special age verification program, a porn registry. The digital economy bill. That's, that's right. The, so the, <laughs> the bill also targets ticket scalpers referred to as, quote, IT crooks due to the fact that they use bots to buy tickets early and quickly, which makes them crooks, I guess, because you're using technology. Uh, what, okay. Uh, anyway, the bill also affects broadband services and TV licenses for those over 75 years old. Uh, don't forget, you need a license to watch TV in the UK. So you have Big Brother spying on your every click on the internet. You have Big Mother, who's who's making sure you're not watching bad porn or porn that shouldn't you know be in your eyes, right? And then you have licenses for TV usage. Now, the the change that's happening here is that. For uh, users over 75 years old, or, uh, you know, in- individuals, I should mm-hmm. say, uh, their license, uh, they, I guess they get a free license, and so that, handling that has been transferred to the British Broadcast Company, so BBC. Okay. So now BBC is is in charge of their the upkeep and maintenance for those licenses, for whatever whatever that means as far as the bureaucracy is concerned. That's bizarre. So, yeah, it's... It, the UK is is really far gone as far as I I mean it's like the the only thing they're missing really and and why hasn't this already happened is Sesame Credit like that's the only thing they they have no guns knives are being taken away right they they every move is spied on they every everything is filtered that they get at this point when anything anything pornography you can label something pornography even if it doesn't directly have to do with sex sure you just have to talk about how it could have something to do with sex and then someone who is not even going to look it up they're not like, oh i couldn't even look that up that's disgusting i'm not going to learn about i'm going to be ignorant and i'm just going to take your word for it yeah that's pornography you know mm-hmm. this show is pornography we said the word <laughs> pornography 17 times so far it, it must be pornography <laughs> that's me right yeah so uh, our listeners might not know that sesame credit is a uh, credit score that you get in China, and it's not really a credit score. It's more of a social media score. Reputation. That, uh, and basically, if you are, behave in a way that the government thinks is good, your score will go up. And if you behave in a way that the government thinks is bad, like post a, a video of Tiananmen Square or something like that, then your rating will go down. And uh, it's also influenced by who you a uh, friend on social media and other things. So that, that's what the Sesame Credit is, which uh, I don't believe there's anything similar over here. Um, of course, there could be, and it could be behind closed doors, but uh, there's nothing out in the open about it. Well, and we, we just uh, had, I think it was two weeks ago, we talked about a story where low uh, credit problem people mm-hmm. were unable to have flights. So they're like bar- barred from taking airplanes in China. So the, huh. the, now this was, the, they claim that this was for people who actually took out bad loans and it was bad debt credit, not Sesame credit. But hmm. at one point, I mean, they're going to blend all the credit together. It's going to be, you're going to have credit. If yeah. If you're, you're paying cash, you can't take the flight or you cannot take I mean, a flight. Period. What should they pay their creditor instead of take the flight or something? I, I don't, it's, it's like TSA says, I'm sorry, sir, you can't get on the plane. They've already bought the ticket and they're not allowed it, to go. It, yeah. I mean, it's, <laughs> I mean, maybe at this point they can't even buy a ticket. Oh well, that may, that's at least a little bit easier, yeah, right? Because right. then you don't have to go to the to the thing and find out that you can't take the flight. But uh, yeah, so it's very interesting in the. Well, land we've got of a surveys. story about scumbag AT and T, uh, and we've been reporting on them for a while and how yeah. at one point they spied on their users for profits. They're well, also well, certainly that is an know. emotionally loaded term, JJ. But uh, yeah, so AT and T uh, uh, that owns uh, Direct TV has announced that its streaming service, DirecTV, now will be zero rated. And what that means is that if you watch DirecTV, it won't be accounted against your data usage cap. And uh, th- there's a concern, basically, that this is going against what's called net neutrality, meaning that all data on the Internet is treated the same. And clearly this would treat DirecTV's uh, signal and, and a preferred rate to other signals. And um, so that's that's what this would do. So T-Mobile has been using the same model for a while, uh, given zero rating to your app services and content, then starting uh, to ratcheting up the cost for data. So, uh, so there is a real concern that uh, the open internet that we've enjoyed up until this point could go away with this because if the cost goes up for 
you know, content that's just kind of not uh, mainstream or not uh, popular or not like people just don't know about it. Uh, if the cost goes up for that, then there will be kind of a migration to consume the information that's in these cheaper channels. And uh, th then it can be a lot easier to manage the information that people are exposed to. So, uh, so there is a concern about this. Uh, I, personally, I think there will be a workaround at some point, like with this story you mentioned in the UK, it's not Tor proof. And uh, even if you have to register on a sex site, uh, chances are it won't be that severe. Like they won't really check if you, you say you're, uh, if you if you make up a name, they probably won't check what your name is. Well, um, I mean, here in the United States, it, it, isn't it true? We we report on uh, the FBI is trying to make it so that if you use Tor, just using Tor is illegal, right? And so, like, I, I imagine something similar like that is in place in the UK. I, I imagine something, maybe not exactly like that, but given all the powers they already have. Mm -hmm. It wouldn't. It wouldn't be a stretch to say. Well, they've also banned tour. Well, well and well, they're also banning, <clears throat> excuse me, certain sexual acts, and so essentially they're creating a new class of criminals, which we've talked about before. Is when there aren't enough uh, crimes being committed, when you aren't bringing enough re enough revenue, you create new crimes, so you create a new wave of criminals, and it's another revenue generation scam from well, the government. Well, think about like, that. That's a great point, Randy. I mean, think about if if crime is down, if. Let's say, you know, there, there, there really isn't much going on there except for, let's say, some migrant activity, and that goes both ways, both on the, on the part of people who live there as well as migrants. Um, but in order to maintain these large police forces, you know, the, the, all these personnel and all the time and, and resources, and, and not, there's no justification through the crime, so just the, the bureaucrats are just going to say, well, you don't need the, that many police, right? So now if you... Increase the number of crimes you're pursuing, as you just said. Yeah. You, you open that, that envelope up as far as, well, okay, so our police aren't just are, are doing these violent crimes. They're also pursuing people who are, are doing sex, sex acts that are deemed uh, pornographic. Yeah, you know, like and that now sort there's of stuff. more enforcement costs and all that, right. and so they need to collect more taxes, and it just keeps growing and growing until every empire falls. Well, you see here, here, here we, we can't tell if they're actually doing the pornographic act in their house, so I think if we install cameras in every mm -hmm. home... Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, how, how, how does this not sound like a movie? In every bedroom. Every bedroom, and right. And living every room, TV, too. We every room has sure. a TV, yeah, yeah. right? Yeah. And yep. the TV has a two-way camera on it. That's, I've got tape over my over hey, my I, little laptop camera right hey, now. Hey, I, I read that book. Yeah. Oh, what are you what are you talking about? I'm the, the 1984. No, no. I'm, we're saying smart TVs. <laughs> oh yeah, they, they do the, that. The camera in it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, and then it's connected to your internet, and they already have all your internet. Right. Right. They already have everything your internet is doing. Yeah, in the UK. So now they can just be like tap into that one TV and be like, "Hey, we see what you're doing there. Please, you're coming by, uh, and I hope you're ready for jail." <laughs> Yeah. Like, <laughs> and then knock, knock, yeah, knock. I mean, orderly, that, orderly, just walk right out. You're just going to jail. Don't fight. Don't that's, resist. Yeah, that's the only thing that's different than uh, the from the fiction to the reality. Is in the fiction, the guy would come on the TV and say, "Hey, stop doing that." Right. But yeah. Well, enough pornography talk. I don't want to get the show banned. Uh, oh, I, you but know. here's the th here's the problem. Okay, here's the problem with AT and T. Yes. They are a super massive company that is looking to be even bigger. Okay, they they if they start this with with just Direct TV, which is violating net neutrality okay that there isn't there isn't a concern they are giving privileged access to, to a company, a company they, they own, they own on, on the internet so they own all these other companies and if they buy time warner you know what i'm saying that that's imagine this same thing just spread across oh all of at&t's uh, our, our, our zero rating anything from us is zero rating mm. this and is this is i imagine six months off what? six six to twelve I mean, and what are competitors going to have to do? I mean, they're they're, they're going to have to along. pay for sponsored data. No, they're going to make data. a lot of money too. Why oh, not? that's going to be kind of cool because the the regular internet that we all know and love, yeah, the people that understand the value of it will stick around, while all the people that don't won't won't. And so it it could actually create a really refined culture, but of course it would create it in a minority of people. Yeah, but. Uh, Oh, well. well, anyway, uh, like, yes, let's go and talk about uh, w uh, one factor that could really influence this AT&T deal is, is President-elect Donald Trump, right? And yes. he has a lot of conflicts. Y yep. Yeah, so uh, the businessman president, uh, Donald Trump, 
was rightly critical of the many conflicts of interest between the Clinton Foundation and foreign governments while Hillary was Secretary of State. And uh, we reported on that uh, a few weeks ago here on Neocache Radio, of course. And you can get archive episodes on neocashradio.com. Where at? <laughs> neocashradio.com. Nice. Um, but now the world is wondering what will come of Trump's global business empire. Uh, he, treated, he tweeted earlier today that he will be holding a press conference on December 15th to announce how he will be taken, quote, completely out of business operations so as to remove any appearance of conflict. I'm, I'm sorry, completely out of business operations, end quote, uh, so as to remove any appearance of conflict between professional and government dealings. Uh, unfortunately, he's left that very open. <clears throat> it's not clear whether he'll be selling his stake in the company or if he'll be handing it over to family members. But even if he removes himself from the company on paper, I mean, the the waters are still going to be pretty cloudy and difficult to navigate. The The New York Times put together a piece that, of course, we've got linked on neocashradio.com. Um, but it, ex- it takes a look at uh, several existing conflicts of interest in place uh, in the Philippines, Brazil, India, Turkey, Ireland, Scotland, uh, and they raise important questions about potential future conflicts. Quote, even if Mr. Trump and his family seek no special advantages from foreign governments, officials overseas may feel compelled to help the Trump family by, say, accelerating building permits or pushing more business to one of the new president's hotels or golf courses. Um, well, and, yes. Yeah, it, it's very real. And we were actually kind of already seeing it in just the few weeks since the election. Uh, Trump's already taken it upon himself to raise concerns about a golf course of his, a golf course of his in Scotland um, with, with a British politician. Uh, he and his family have hosted real estate partners from India and the Philippines in his office. And his daughter Ivanka, who is in charge of planning and development for the Trump Organization Hotels, has already been busy joining uh, calls with world leaders from Turkey, Argentina, and Japan. Uh, the Trump Organization has also been urging diplomats to consider staying in the new Trump Hotel, which, would, would you believe this? It's con- just a few convenient blocks from the White House. Wow. And so they're they're encouraging diplomats to stay there when in Washington to meet the president or his team. This uh, is like what? a movie, too. What, what yeah. This is not like a movie, Darren. Oh, it's it's worse. It's worse than a movie, <laughs> right, because it's real. <laughs> I mean... <laughs> like it's, it's like a I mean, movie. well, in this golf course in Scotland, so I went down a oh god, I went down a couple of rabbit holes today. This golf course in Scotland, I I don't know what particularly con- which concern he raised, but um, there's houses, there's there's some footage that the Golf Channel just released. Apparently, there was some awful show in 2009 or something called Donald Trump's Wonderful World of Golf. It didn't last long, but he got this golf course in Scotland, and they're just raising land, and there's a couple houses nearby, and he's on video just berating the Greens supervisor, who I guess he ended up firing later, but told him to use his effing brain, and just, he puts like a cash, wad of cash in some dude's pocket while he's there, and he yells to somebody, he's like, hey, get that house out of here, and they're like, well, that's probably going to cause quite a stir, he goes, "Who, who cares? It's our property. Put up trees. Block their view. They've got this beautiful ocean view, and these people have been fighting him. He put up this. He he built a wall. <laughs> Seriously, he, <laughs> he built, built a wall. He built a wall <laughs> nice. around this golf course, and he sent the residents the bill. <laughs> oh, no kidding. There's precedent. Yeah. <laughs> oh God. So anyway, um, you can go down a little rabbit hole about uh, the Scottish golf course, but this is the kind of stuff he's prioritizing. Like during this transition time, like he's. Uh, negotiating all these strange things and making all these little mentions to to politicians and uh, so, yeah, it so is like a movie. The, here's the recipe that I'm seeing. It, it's <laughs> you have this guy with amazing powers. Like Obama had all these amazing executive order type powers given to himself, or or even just passed in the law with the Patriot Act and all mm-hmm. that stuff. Then you get you you add into that a guy that's our he's been doing this stuff for a long time he's been in the business stuff and he has a lot of connections he already has you know a lot of uh, you know, irons in the fire if you will okay and you add the attitude of like I don't care what people think okay mm-hmm. and this is a recipe for disaster this is absolutely disaster he's gonna be pitching deals out of the the White House uh, uh, Rose Garden like you know what I'm saying he's gonna he, he talked on the campaign trail about giving it to his his kids, okay? And they were they brought up the fact that well, that isn't a blind trust, right? You know, those are your kids, right? So like, if even if he does that, if, even if he does what he said, you know, it's a terrible situation, right? There's and certainly, now, and if he obfuscates it with like, oh, I'm I'm doing I'm giving it to this other person that has no connection to me whatsoever, but he's gonna stay in Trump Tower. 
You know, like, he <laughs> <laughs> can't leave. <laughs> Well, yeah, you can imagine the shakedown in the office, right? Oh, did you stay in my hotel? Which which suite did you get? The best one, right? Like that, yeah. you can only imagine how much that costs per night. And it's like, that's the way to get around uh, money from foreign governments directly. But your organization, you know, say you stay in this suite for who knows how much money and you're from the some diplomat from Saudi Arabia or whatever, just fill in the blank. But you pay an exorbitant amount of money to maybe stay in this hotel or just stay in this hotel on paper. But that's the way you launder it. And get away from direct contributions to a candidate to advance your own personal goals. Yeah. So the the thing that gets me is that the, this stuff, the way we think about it, you know, having some time on this earth and, and growing up and, and seeing the way things used to be and the way things are now, it, it's, I, I, it's unfathomable to me to think about what a six year old is going to think about all this because they're growing up in it. Right. And, yeah. uh, it, and from my perspective, it does not look like there's any chance of this slowing down at all. They're on both the candidate and both the major candidates for presidents had major conflict of interest, major, you know, doing stuff behind the scenes and all that. Not that they're not supposed to do stuff behind the scenes. It's just, they're, they're really trying to be manipulative. And, um, and so, uh, and what got Nixon impeached is very mild compared to, all the allegations that have been levied in both in oh, all sure. directions. No kidding. Really. Oh sure. I hadn't thought about that, but no kidding. Murder. <laughs> Gosh. Murder. Like Hillary is is well known for all of these accusations of her having you know murder or or uh, associated with associated it. right right Benghazi or people that have been Gaddafi. Uh, Gaddafi. Oh yeah, definitely that one. But then the people investigating her that all disappear mysteriously, and it's just like a consistent thing that happens. And uh, but but it, I mean okay so. Here's my my only redeeming point that I see is that this recent election has started a lot of the N A the uh, like N H exits the Cal exits the uh, Tex exit and like so there's a lot of, of talk of secession that is really f- like like formed in the, in the overnight top. basically right. yeah independence movements right exactly and I think this is a very healthy reaction and something that that I want to see more of of course but it's it's like this could actually happen. I think I think that by the time Trump's first term is up, you're going to have one state r- leave the union. Well, freedom one, should at least one state. Freedom should be the ability to leave an abusive relationship. But I have a feeling. <laughs> I have a feeling that it's going to be a, a group of states first. Imagine like a California, Oregon, Washington, some yeah. some group yeah, that, whole or or a Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont sort of yeah. thing like. Groups that make sense that they they'd go, or maybe somewhere in the south. For I don't know. Well, Texas by itself, <laughs> right? I exactly. mean, that's been discussed enough. And... Uh, so, I, I just think that's 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 one thing I think is is very very real possibility. I mean, well, and there's there's one other item that the New York Times article touched on with Trump was that um, you know there's there's thoughts of needing increased security at Trump hotels all around the world, especially in the Middle East. You know the. And I can see it being spun now, you know, if we had another 9-11 type attack or big attack or something on a Trump hotel, it's it's an easy way for a government to do a false flag, uh, red herring, and, and just say like, oh, they were targeting our our president's properties, you know, Trump hotel, they're exactly. attacking America. And it's here a, we go, yep. a full-fledged World War III, and then this will be a call once again, as we saw with 9-11, for, for jingoism and just extreme patriotism. Where And so then if you're calling for secession... I don't, I don't think that would work again. I, I think they use that ploy, and I think that's 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 done. And I, I hope I think, so. I really think they don't they don't have to do anything. They don't even have to worry. They don't have to care. The media is sitting there going to report whatever they talk talk about. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Our redeeming, our, our our only redemption, it really comes through WikiLeaks, and we've got a story about them right now. Yep. So uh, WikiLeaks published HB Gary emails uh, as Whistler. Whistleblower uh, Barrett Brown is pardoned. So, um, well, he's paroled. He wasn't pardoned. Well, you paroled. Yeah, he wasn't pardoned. That's right. So, uh, thank you, Randy. So, uh, to commission to commemorate whistleblower Barrett Brown's early release on parole, WikiLeaks has published a searchable database of over sixty thousand emails reportedly leaked from the former U.S. cybersecurity contractor H. B. Gary. Uh, Barrett Brown is a Texas-based journalist who spent nearly two years locked in a federal prison. Uh, for his for his reporting on the HB Gary emails hacked by Anonymous, which is a uh, a loose group of uh, 
the people on the internet acting anonymously in in 2011 and the uh, 2012 private uh, hack of private intelligence com- co- company uh straight Stratfor. Stratfor. so um yeah, so that's that's what happened. I mean, WikiLeaks has lots of stuff coming out. I, even I read on the paper today, or not today, but this week, that uh, w- WikiLeaks was publishing uh, emails from like UNH administrators and uh, University of New Hampshire. Yeah, N- University of New Hampshire administrators, and uh, yeah, and they actually found some. Uh, that's right. There wrong was a story about that. Yeah, basically happening. Huh. Yeah, so they yeah. were uh, somehow comp- campaigning for Clinton. Yeah, see, the or, pro- or like yeah, diverting funds or, or personnel and, or something. And I don't the, call it that's all fine and dandy, but the problem was they were doing it with their public resources. Right. Uh, if they did it with a private email, uh, then I, I don't think many people would have uh, much trouble with it, as long as they're not like saying they are the university. So, uh, so but, what are the HP HP Gary emails uh, show? Like what were what were they about? Well, it, this was before this happened before Edward Snowden came forward, and this was yeah. sort of some of the earliest peaks into the the U.S. corporate surveillance industry, and it was showing how government agencies and these private intelligence firms work together to spy on people uh, with little to no oversight. Um, and what a lot of the what several of these emails showed uh, was ways that. The, these agencies and government agencies uh, spread disinformation and propaganda, and they actually are pitching government agencies, businesses. They pitch something to Bank of America uh, before WikiLeaks released a bunch of Bank of America emails. Um, but they started pitching these companies ideas for ways to sabotage or discredit these organizations and to actually go after individual journalists. Um, Glenn Greenwald. Uh, from from the Guardian was mentioned in one of these pr- uh, presentations, um, and it basically wants to start smear campaigns, p- submitting false documents, and to sort of point out the error when they happen. Um, and in one of these presentations, they said that WikiLeaks would fold without support from writers like Glenn Greenwald. So that's why they wanted to go after people like that, um, wanting to silence them because. Quote, they think that uh, many of these writers, quote, ultimately, uh, most, if pushed, would choose professional preservation over cause. So basically saying, like, make it so that they have that they're going to have to lose their job if they don't back off. OK. And so they're, they're basically trying to have a chilling effect and, yeah. and shut down free speech, free reporting and create disinformation and have it come from an official source or have it look like, you know, it came out of nowhere or. Just so to, these these were actually some pretty important emails to be hacked. I mean, as, as to be shared or, or to be spread about because of their, I mean, they're they're really you're, you're talking about they're dealing with subterfuge. They're, these emails sort of help with, uh, you know, covering up the truth or or, or disinformation campaigns and. In, to get the truth about them early on, and I think it's a very valuable thing. And it's the same crap we saw from the Clinton campaign when the Podesta emails came out. This sure. is exactly what they were seeking to to do. This kind of methodology, uh, it's manufactured. So, and, and yeah, Barrett Brown spent uh, was sentenced to sixty three months in jail, but got out on parole early after nearly two years. Um, but his house was raided, his mother's house was raided, um, and he was hit with felony charges. He's going to have a you know a felon tag on his record for who knows how many years and that's that's pretty you, you can't own a firearm you can't d- sure. defend yourself uh you you know you can't do a number of things you got to check that box off anytime you want a bank loan or get a job or uh any of that kind of stuff well yeah. we've got a lot more to talk about here and a uh, hacker holds san francisco railway to ransom and demands a hundred bitcoins that's that's a chunk of change yeah about seventy three thousand dollars wow so uh what, what happened with that Oh, so the uh, San Francisco Municipal Railway uh, fell victim to a ransomware attack over the weekend. The entire ticketing system was offline on Friday evening and all day Saturday with all agent computer screens displaying the message. You hacked. All data encrypted. Contact for key and has an email address and an ID. All your base are belong to us. Yes. So, yeah, I mean, just... uh, those types of messages make me think it's somebody who doesn't have English as a native language. But anyway, that's, I mean, whoever's doing it, um, the, the hacker demanded 100 Bitcoin to decrypt the files and threatened to release the 30 gigabytes of documents and data reportedly accessed during the hack. Muni officials 
Oh, this I actually love this story, JJ. Oh yeah. So instead of actually paying the ransomware guy, yes, what they did is they just let everybody ride the bus for free or train for free. That's what they did. They just opened the gates. Their ticketing system doesn't work. You need to take a train. Take a train, right? Doesn't doesn't um, doesn't interfere with anybody getting to work. Doesn't you know? It just saves you a little bit of money. I yeah. mean, and uh, and then. Uh, they, then they were able to fix their system without paying the hacker, uh, I believe, a, in a day later. So uh, they they estimate that they lost uh, $560,000 about uh, uh, on a, in, a, in one day. Wow. On ticket sales. But, you know, uh, I, I really like the idea of the, uh, the money going to just people using the train instead of uh, the money going to... Uh, somebody doing the wrong thing, somebody well, sure. being the ransomware guy. And I, I really am a strong proponent of not paying ransomware people. Well, I think for, in this case, it was like a double whammy. Not only did they not pay the ransom, but then they also had their customer base get some for free rides. I'm sure they all enjoyed that. And right. Like, wow, this Moody is really cool, man. I really <laughs> hated that this happened to you, dude, but... Thanks for the free ride. Yeah, I mean... But I, this isn't the end of the story, is it? Right? Yeah. It, it, the day... I don't think they were... Tar- were they targeted, Darren? Oh, no. They weren't specifically targeted in this ransomware attack. Rather, the hacker's code was automatically scouring for vulnerable computer system. In a funny twist, the hacker behind this uh, this hack got hacked. But um, Really? Yeah. But uh, basically, uh, on the Krebs on security blog, there was a post that was tracking the uh, transactions to this criminal, to, to this uh, ransomware fellow. And he apparently he successfully stored about at least a hundred and forty thousand dollars in Bitcoin, uh, and uh, most of them were uh, contractors and uh, construction, manufacturing and construction. Well, we've for, got uh, we've got a great write up on this story on our blog too, so definitely check it out neocashradio.com. dot com. But uh, we're on a Stripe, so Stripe is blown up. It's a big thing. It's blowing up. Yes, Stripe is. Uh an online payment processor and they take care of uh, like Kickstarter uh, transactions. They also do Lyft transactions, Wish. Um, It's a private company. It doesn't disclose its revenue figures, but a new Forbes report shows that uh, new funding for the company brings its valuation up to $9.2 billion. Wow. Uh, This makes both of the Stripe co-founders, Patrick's Brothers Patrick and John Collison, ages 28 and 26 respectively, worth a million of 1.1 billion dollars each. So that's a lot of money. The younger brother John Collison is the youngest self-made billionaire in the world now. Um, so Forbes sources say that the company processes about 20 billion dollars, or processed about 20 billion dollars last year, and so with its published share of transactions the estimated revenue would be about 450 million dollars last year um they've got investments now, from sequoia capital peter thiel now, Elon now Musk. of course this is based on company valuation and then yes. their portion of ownership so this is purely fictional all right they're the value speculative, yeah. speculative fictional someone has to buy the company for 9.2 right. billion to prove that right but that is extremely impressive and the fact that they're you know what so how much of a percentage they own like Together, they own about a quarter of the company. Yeah, they, they were estimating that before this funding, each brother owned about 30%, and now they're thinking it's around 12% each. So, yeah, around a quarter. With the, wow. So is, they, and they again, even, estimated. So, so one of these uh, investors, Sequoia Capital and Driesen Horowitz, PayPal co-founders Peter Thiel, Max Levchin. Levchin and, and Elon Musk. Wow, I wonder which one of those owns uh, the, the, the controlling stake. No anyway. wonder, but I, it's... Again, this is something like PayPal where they're extra and credit cards yes, and things where they're taking a percentage for dollar, something Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies do for free. Dollars. Yeah, exactly. But uh, so we're talking about cryptocurrencies doing it for free. Well, there's a fee in, involved with most of them. But uh, in the Ethereum case, the fee for uh, the fee for dealing with the attacker was uh, putting up with a, a bogged down network for the last week. But uh, at, after the fork happened, they went through, poked the accounts. And Vitalik recently, I think it was yesterday, uh, declared the state clearing 100% complete. So uh, the, the hard fork happened, the accounts got cleared out, but this ended up having a problem, a, a bug appeared in the guest client, in fact, and it went and forked on its own. Um, right. 
So they they were able to put a fix together. If you are running Guess, you should you need to update to 1.5.3 right now or higher. Uh, anything previous to that will be on the invalid chain. So definitely upgrade now. The bug chain is about a well, well was about 165 abandoned blocks worth of transactions and whatnot. And I think they. I don't know how they handled that. Like if they tried to replay the transactions. Well, you, what happens with uh, a fork like this is if you broadcast a fork in the network, chances are it will confirm on the main chain. And if it happened to confirm in one of these other blocks, it doesn't affect uh, a block in the other chain. So it could most likely it could have confirmed in both chains uh, when uh, Bitcoin had the unplanned fork that happened sure. when their database updated. Uh, I I actually sent a transaction during that time, and I was able to search blockchain.info and fi- find that it uh, this transaction actually had confirmed on both chains. So, uh, so so even well, that's if, good to know, Darren. So even if it gets confirmed in the wrong chain, one of these 165 blocks, uh, since it is actually a chain, those 165 blocks aren't building towards the the main network so it still can confirm in the main network as well excellent well some of our listeners might know that the show is kind of gone on a little bit longer than usual in fact this show is longer than our normal half an hour i i, I think it's good we were expanding a little bit but we've got one more story to talk about so hang in there for this last one and venezuela comes in the news again randy yeah, so Reason.com put up an article uh, called The Secret Dangerous World of Venezuelan Bitcoin Mining, How Cryptocurrency is Turning Socialism Against Itself. Uh, and it's a really great in-depth piece that I, I recommend people take a look at. Um, it's looking at the growing use of Bitcoin in Venezuela. And of course, if you've been listening to Neocash Radio, we've covered this topic quite a bit. Um, and, and the boulevard continues to tank in value. Uh, there's some great profiles of how Venezuelans are using Bitcoin to get access to food and other necessities as the store shelves continue to dry up there. Um, the story talks about one Bitcoin miner in particular in Venezuela who makes about $1,200 daily, he says, um, mining Bitcoin, and he uses it to import food from the U.S. through Amazon's Prime Pantry service. So I, I was amazing. Yeah, it's, dude, it's awesome to read this. So... Um, it basically, it would be impossible to do with bolivars because almost no one outside of Venezuela accepts them, uh, and there's a growing scarcity of U.S. currency in the country. And so um, even though Amazon doesn't accept Bitcoin on its own, of course, there's other intermediary companies that do. And so this miner um, purchases Amazon gift cards through eGifter, which takes Bitcoin and issues Amazon gift cards, and then he uses additional software to mask the location of his computer so it looks like he's in the United States. And he gets his orders routed to a Miami-based courier service that'll deliver his God. food and groceries. My goodness, all this to get some food. Right. And right. Yeah. So uh, another guy talks about how he feeds his family with groceries that he gets from Walmart.com using a prepaid net teller card, um, depositing Bitcoins and getting dollars. And also, like, every three weeks, he loads up his card with Bitcoins and crosses over to Colombia to stock up on other stuff. Um, but the... I, I, I just think it's so amazing that he's using Amazon Prime and Bitcoin <laughs> to import food, which is extremely valuable there because of the difficulty of getting food. Right. Uh, this is uh, that's a wonderful story, Randy. Thanks. It's an awesome story, and it's just got uh, the government's cracking down. That's the danger: is they're they're taking note of energy spikes. You're trying to feed yourself. Yeah, they're taking. How note dare of, you? Of electricity Try. spikes and. Uh, <laughs> Basically running stories calling Bitcoin a t- tool of cyber criminals, and they're cracking down and arresting people for mining it. So, Just a reminder that you can tune in to Neocache Radio every Wednesday night. Don't want to miss a single moment of the awesome Neocache content, including special episodes and bonus interviews? Subscribe to our podcast on Google Play Music, iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, YouTube, Podcast Addict, and more. This is JJ. Darren. And Randy. Neocache Radio. Neocacheradio.com. Neocache Radio.